When I was nine years old, I climbed into an aluminum rowboat with the elderly director of a summer camp north of Toronto. He rowed us a quarter mile out into the bay, and we spent the next two hours fishing. I caught 16 fish that day. Uh, most of them were little ones tossed back into the water, but several of the big ones were kept for breakfast the next morning. Uh, I was a sensitive boy uh, with a soft spot for animals, so a lot of what went on with that in that boat disturbed me. Mr. Nelson did all the dirty work, uh, putting earthworms onto the hooks, pulling them out of the fishes, and plunging his knife into the keepers. I never took a shine to fishing. When it came time to bait my own hooks, I soon lost any interest I had earlier. I just couldn't help seeing it from the fish's perspective. But I made no association between those fishes on my line and the anonymous ones who ended up in my filet of fish sandwiches that I would order on occasional visits to McDonald's. At that time, McDonald's was boasting over a billion served. They were referring to customers, but they could just as soon have been referring to fish or chicken for that matter. And I also remember seeing, as you can today, the stacks of cans in the supermarket, cans of tuna, and not having a clue what a tuna is, not knowing that a tuna is an apex predator, can grow to 1,500 pounds, I guess that's 600 or so kilos, and uh, hunts in coordinated schools. At that time, there were also a dolphin safe tuna campaigns, and I remember wondering, how come there's no tuna safe tuna campaigns? So today I want to invite you to see fishes through a different lens. I've spent several years studying fish and the research published about them, culminating in this book, uh, What a Fish Knows. There are some English edition books I brought with me here, but there's also the French edition available. The first thing I want you to know about fish is that they're incredibly diverse and successful. We are actually living in an age of fishes. The age of mammals is past. Uh, the mammal diversity on Earth peaked several millions of years ago. Uh, fishes in the last few million years have exploded into huge diversity. And there's two main groups, the bony fish or teleosts, of which all of the ones except for two on this slide are representatives. And then there's the chondrichthians or the elasmobranchs or the cartilaginous fish. And the shark and the ray here are the two examples of that. They are, those two groups are as different from each other as birds from mammals, but we call them all fish, just because it's a useful collective term, and they all have fins, and they're generally streamlined and can move smoothly through the water. But they're quite different. Their, their evolutionary origins go far back. And with such diversity, you find some interesting, what I like to call superlatives, and I'd like to share just a few of those. Probably the smallest vertebrate on Earth is this little fish from some Philippine freshwater lakes. You could put 300 of them onto one side of a scale and an Amer a Canadian penny on the other, and the penny will go down. I don't recommend doing that, but you could do that. The new uh, record for longevity in a vertebrate goes to the Greenland shark. One female in several who were caught, you can measure the growth rings in the cornea of the eye, and it's like measuring the rings of a tree. It's one ring per um, year. And so by measuring those rings, you can get a, an age count. And one of the females had 392 uh, ring, uh, gr layers on her cornea. So she was approaching her 400th birthday when she was caught, apparently still healthy, by a fisherman's net. The longest fish name goes to the Hawaiian reef triggerfish, known by the locals as the Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apua'a. And that is Hawaiian, apparently, for the fish who sings like a pig or sorry, sews with a needle and grunts like a pig. My nominee for the most appropriate name for a fish is the diagonal banded sweet lips. I don't know about you, but when I see those lips, I want to give them a big kiss. Pretty adorable. And my nominee for what must be one of the most awkward adolescences in nature goes to the flatfish, who must suffer the indignity of having one eye migrate from one side of the body to the other during their young years. It can actually happen in five days. One of the common myths about fish that you'll hear is they don't feel pain. I don't know where we got that from. These are vertebrate animals. They have fully developed nervous systems. Pain is very useful to signal I should get away and go somewhere else. 
in one study of zebra fishes, they put them in a, in a complex tank with a, two chambers connected with each other. One chamber had veg vegetation and was dimly lit. It's a good place to hide, so it's the kind of place they like to be. But if they wanted, they could swim across to another part of the tank, which was barren and brightly lit. They spent all of the time in the first chamber where they felt safe. And they, they continued to stay there after scientists injected them with either acid, which causes lasting pain, or saline, which doesn't. But when the scientists dropped some lidocaine, a painkiller, into just the barren tank, the one that they avoided, some of the fishes would swim across and spend their time in that tank, presumably because they got the pain relief. So this study, but only the ones who'd been injected with the acid, the ones who had had the saline injection stayed in this side of the tank. So that study demonstrates that not only fishes have the wherewithal to go and seek pain relief, but they're willing to pay a cost to do it. They're willing to go and swim in a place that they would normally avoid to get pain relief. Uh, to me, that's a pretty compelling demonstration of pain in a, an animal. Flip side of pain is pleasure. And fishes show behavior that's consistent with the desire for reward or pleasure. This this um, NASA grouper is swimming up to a trusted diver to get strokes, to get petted. And that presumably is pleasurable for them. Why would they do it? There's no food being given to them here. I will refer to another study in a few minutes that relates to this. This is a, a vet student from Kansas who, uh, when I presented information about that, she said, oh yeah, my, my dad and I go diving in the Cayman Islands every year, and I'll send you some pictures of me uh, with this wild fish, and there she is uh, stroking this fish under the chin, and they're posing for the camera. I don't know if a fish can take a selfie, but that's pretty close. We often think fishes are not very intelligent as well, and uh, I don't know where we get that from. Maybe it's because we don't relate to them as well, because they live under the water, and they don't blink, and we don't hear the sounds they make. And we often think they have poor memories. This is a frilfin goby, a little fish of the Atlantic seaboard. And they demonstrate an inc incredibly good memory. Um, they live in the intertidal zone. And it's been noticed they can jump from one tide pool to another. How do they know which way to jump? And how do they know how far? Well, a series of captive experiments showed that they memorize, they make a mental map of the tide zone at high tide. So when the water comes in, they swim over it. They swim down among the nooks and crannies. And they make a mental map. They form a memory of that topography. And then when it's low tide, they can somehow translate that aerial view into a horizontal view, and they know exactly how far and which direction to jump. They can learn that in one day, and you can test them 40 days later without any, without any experience with that zone in the meantime, and they can still remember it. It's called mental mapping. I call it pretty smart. Tool use is demonstrated in fish. You can see YouTube videos of fish like this tusk fish who blow water on the sand to uncover a, a mollusk, then pick it up and swim very deliberately to a particular rock or piece of coral, and with a series of well-timed and coordinated head flicks, sometimes swimming on their side, they smash open that mollusk to get at the soft tissue inside. It's tool use. They don't have hands, but they can use their mouths. Another kind of tool use is practiced by the archer fish, which squirts water as a projectile to knock fishes off, le uh, sorry, knock insects off leaves, or to actually pick off insects flying above the water. They can actually shoot them down. They use two methods to do that. If the insect is flying close to the water, they do a turn and shoot. So if this is the fish and this is the insect, they actually rotate at the same rate as the fish as the insect is flying, and then shoot directly at it. If it's further away, they use a football technique or a quarterback technique where they squirt ahead. And if the insect doesn't change direction, they'll catch it. They can squirt water t about three meters maximum. And they can learn this by watching other fish do that. That's called learning, observational learning, another pretty cognitive, impressive cognitive feat. And because archerfishes squirt water, they're very useful for studies, captive studies of seeing if they can recognize things. So on the panel on the right here, this archerfish can squirt at a touchpad displayed over the tank and show you that uh, I recognize this face and I don't recognize that face. This study has been done to show that archerfish recognize human faces. Even if we've removed the hair and the ears, 
They all look pretty similar to me, but the archerfish, if you present them with 40 faces, only one of which is familiar, they'll squirt water at that face if you train them to pick them, to reward them with the familiar one. Fishes are very visual, a lot of them, but they uh, also are subject to what's called the face inversion effect. effect. Uh, a familiar fish that's presented upside down, they have difficulty recognizing it. Uh, we have the same problem. We're not very good at recognizing upside down faces. Chimpanzees are quite good at it, and this probably relates to their natural behavior. Do fishes fall for optical illusions? Yes, they do. This is the Ebbinghaus illusion in which the two orange circles are the same size, but the one on the right looks bigger than the one on the left because of the arrangements of the blue circles. If you test a fish and reward the fish for choosing the larger of two circles and then present them with this, they'll swim up and bump their nose or pick the button for whatever, however they choose to show that the one on, they think the one on the right is bigger. There are other kinds of illusions that have been tested on fish that they also show uh, the same response that we do. They, I think there's something very poignant about that. It says that a fish can have beliefs and that those beliefs can be wrong. They can be fallible. They can make, make mistakes like, like we do. How very human of them. Some fish use interesting and useful visual tools to make their lives safer. These two photographs are of the same ambon damselfish, but the one on the left taken in visible light. The one on the right is with ultraviolet light. And you can see under ultraviolet light this constellation of, of dots, kind of like a fingerprint, unique to each individual. So it's a way they can ad identify and recognize each other as individuals without compromising their camouflage against predators who, who cannot see in the ultraviolet light spectrum. Anyone ever heard of flatulent communication? Flatulent communication? No? No? Well, herring practice flatulent communication. They uh, release bubbles out of their anuses uh, in the dark to communicate information among the school. Uh, they can actually, uh, the scientists playfully call them uh, frequent repetitive ticks. It makes a sound. You can do the acronym and they can do that for seven seconds in a row. I encourage you to try that at home. And it's a, it's a very innovative form of communication, fish farting. One of the most remarkable interspecies communications known to all among any animal is, happens between groupers and moray eels. These are two large predators on reefs. And a grouper, and again, you can watch YouTube videos of this too, if a grouper is hungry and wants to team up with a moray eel, the grouper will swim up to the moray eel and do a, a head shake or a whole body shimmy. This is an invitation to the moray, let's go hunting together. And if the moray wants to, off they swim. They look like a couple of Disney characters. It's quite amazing. And it works because their two hunting styles are complementary to each other. A moray eel can chase a little fish into the reef and if the moray eel catches that fish, the moray eel gets to have the fish. But if the fish escapes to open water, the grouper is waiting there. So the poor uh, target fish doesn't have many options. And the, the two fishes get a, up to five times as much food per hour if they hunt cooperatively than if they hunt individually. And that signal, that head shake, is called a referential gesture, a referential signal, because it's referring to something else later in time and in a different space. So that's a very sophisticated form of communication, is a referential communication, a gesture, something that's very familiar to us. Follow-up studies at Cambridge University find that groupers know specific moray eels, and they only choose cooperative ones. If, if, it's, if a moray eel, this is a fake one, laminated, and so that scientists control it, can control it with pulleys and make it go in and back in to the burrow or come out. So they'll prefer, uh, the, gr the, more, the grouper will prefer a cooperative moray eel, fake moray eel, over a non-cooperative one the next day. So they remember who's who. They know they hunt with, with specific individuals they recognize. Do fishes practice art so that they have a sense of aesthetics? Well, according to observations like this, which is a, a nest made by a tiny little puffer fish that was pre previously unknown to science until this was discovered just a few years ago. Uh, the male spends several days constructing and, and keeping, maintaining this six-foot Mandela-like structure in the about 100 feet down in the ocean floor near Japan, it's a Japanese species. 
it's an amazing construction and it's very beautiful and you can probably guess why he does it. He's trying to impress a female, he's trying to attract, it's sort of like a fish version of a peacock's tail. And if she's suitably impressed, they lay their eggs there and he fertilizes the eggs. They bring little stones and bits of, uh, bits of shell and they sprinkle it over the eggs to cover them. Uh, and then they raise their young. I have to say, I have no idea why it works. I can see why it's attractive to the female, but um, to me it looks like a big stamp in the sand, like eggs, fresh eggs, predators, come and get them here. It looks like a restaurant sign. But obviously it works because it's evolved, and it's the product of, of millions of years of choosy females preferring males who make nice nests. One of the theories here is the good genes idea. A male who can survive and meet his needs and do that produce something like that, must be a very good quality male, must have very good genes. He's worth mating with and getting his genes with my genes in the next generation. So goes the theory. So fishes are smart, they can feel pain and pleasure. Can they feel stressed? Can they be worried? Can they be upset? Can they be emotional? Absolutely they can. This is from a, a picture of a striated surgeon fish. Here's one study. 30 of them were caught on the Great Barrier Reef. That's stressful to begin with. And then they were put in a bucket of shallow water for half an hour. That's very stressful. You can measure stress in a fish by taking a blood sample from the tail vein, from the caudal peduncle. And they took a little blood from... And by the way, let me just a disclaimer here. I'm not necessarily endorsing these studies. Some of these studies are not very nice to fish. But somebody's done them. And if by describing them, I can hopefully make the the world a better place for fish in future, then I'll do that. So that's kind of my approach here. I'm not necessarily endorsing these studies or saying we should do more of them or that we can't come up with more innovative ways to study stress, perhaps. Nevertheless, um, remarkable finding. Uh, the stress levels are very high in the blood. Cortisol levels were very high after they'd come out of the bucket. And then they gave the fish an opportunity to get strokes, to get that nice massage like that. Nassau grouper you saw earlier. And how they did that was they made a model of a cleaner fish, and I should have described this earlier, but I didn't. These are, uh, this is a, just a realistic wooden model or a plastic model. And if the stressed surgeon fish was put in a tank with uh, one of these cleaner wrasses that would moving in a waving motion because it was attached to a motor, they would go up to it and get strokes, and their stress levels would come down. The massage was therapeutic for them. If they were in a control group and they were put in a tank where there was no motor, so that fish was just stationary, couldn't give them strokes, nothing. They, they made no visits to that fish and didn't get any strokes, and their stress levels remained high. So this is a study that shows that a, a surgeon fish, at least, not only gets stressed, but will seek relief from stress, and that their stress will come down when they get stroked. So we have fish evidence that massage therapy is effective for them. I'm happy to say that all the 32 fishes survived the study and were released back into the Great Barrier Reef. That's unusual, but it's good to, to know. There's also published evidence now of play in fish, where these little cichlids would interact with a semi-buoyant thermometer by bumping it in, in idiosyncratic ways. And probably it was relief of boredom because they were each housed alone in a single tank. And fishes, like most animals, don't like to be alone, don't like to be forced to be living alone for long. Fishes have personalities. Everyone is unique. Everyone is an individual. It doesn't matter how many, how many there are numerically. They're all absolutely unique. The proverbial grains of sand are unique. But fishes are more unique because they have more behaviors than sand grains do. This is uh, Mango, a nine-year-old puffer fish. That's the one on the left. And when his human guardian would come home from work, they would spend minutes looking at each other. So whether, she said it was kind of like a staring contest. It looks to me like kind of they're, they're in love with each other in this photo. And then they would play games. She would run back and forth, and the fish would swim back and forth. Uh, and this is just one example of many that I got when I was researching my book, of people who, who know, have individual fish, and they have particular games. One woman would cup her hands, and the fish would swim into her hands, and she'd stroke it with her thumb probably stress relieving for that fish, as we know from those other studies. Can fish be virtuous? Can they have a, um, be sort of morally good, or at least do good deeds for another? Yes, they can. 
These are four species of rabbit fish. It's a reef fish that feeds on algae on the reef, and they often forage in pairs. So while one fish is in the vulnerable position with the head down foraging on algae, the other one, as you can see in each case, is playing a lookout. That fish is looking up, watching out for trouble, watching out for danger. If a moray eel comes along, the fish will give a warning and they'll quickly swim away to safety. But of course, this fish is foregoing food right now. It's delayed gratification. That's a, that's a virtuous thing to do, is to make a personal sacrifice to ben benefit someone else. Of course, after a couple of minutes, they switch places, and the one who was feeding down there comes up and plays lookout. So they both get more food in a much safer way than if they foraged alone. Can sharks be virtuous? We speak of feeding frenzies. It's just a jargon term. It's just a popular term. There's actually a lot of consideration and care among sharks when they're feeding. This is a still photograph from a video in which the shark on the bottom had just grabbed the piece of meat. It was People were chumming and filming it. And this one came along trying to get the piece of meat and got there just a little bit late and was about to chomp down on the nose of this other shark. One day when I get videos embedded in my talks and I can get that to work, because I, I, you get, a video is much better, and there are videos of, of this as well. Right after this still photo was taken, this shark uh, opened the jaws as wide as it could and, and quickly turned the head to the side so nobody got hurt. It looks like somebody's about to get hurt there. You can almost see the surprise in this shark's face as this shark reacts and gets out of the way. All right, this is the most remarkable interspecies interaction, or one of the most well-studied mutualisms, a symbiosis, where plus plus, both, both animals benefit, known in any animals. It's been very well studied, probably over 200 published papers on this. These are two blue striped cleaner asses working as a pair, and they are cleaning this pliant fish, in this case a porcupine fish. This fish will have waited in a queue to wait their turn on the reef to a particular station to swim up, and then will just sit there in the water and get treatment from these other fish. What they're doing is these ones are plucking parasites off. They go right in inside the mouth. They go in the, in the gills, and they remove parasites and algae and other undesirable things from the skin of these client fish. So they get food, and they, they benefit by getting a parasite removal service. So it's a win-win. Both parties benefit. And there's a lot of trust. This is a predatory fish, but it's not a good idea to eat your business partner. So they never, they never actually eat the, cl the clients, even though they could. In the mouth they go. They're quite courageous. So everybody benefits, but sometimes it gets Machiavellian. There's cheating that goes on. There's sometimes they, the cleaners don't do such a good job. They, for instance, might do what's called mucus nipping, where they take a little moat of that slimy outer layer off the client fish. It's very tasty and nutritious. Client fish don't like that. They jolt when it happens. And that's probably a way of signaling to the cleaners, as well as other fish in the queue. These guys aren't doing a very good job this, these days. So. The cleaner fish, wanting to keep their eBay ratings high, they, know, they will do a better job. And this has been studied. They do a better job if there are lots of clients waiting in the queue. They have more at stake. They have more to lose. If there's few clients or no clients, they might do a shoddy job. Uh, again, it's like the, the moray eel and the grouper. These fish know each other, and they have long-term relationships. So there's reputations at stake. It's very, very complicated. I mentioned virtue in fish. Well, can we be virtuous to fish? Yes, we can. There are scientists now and other divers who actually uh, give belly rubs and back rubs to sharks who know them and trust them and get them into a very relaxed state. Tonic immobility is the jargon term. I just call it hyper-relaxation. And when they're like that, you can remove hooks from their mouths, such as this blue shark who, um, a few minutes after this photo was taken, this large hook was using uh, bolt cutters was removed from the shark's mouth. The shark continued to swim around them for some 25 minutes or so. Was the shark grateful? Did the shark feel thanks for them doing that? We can speculate. It's hard to know. You can't really just ask the shark. We interpret that kind of thing in whales. Well, sharks have pretty big brains. They're long-lived. Why not suggest that they can also feel gratitude for a good deed? And indeed, the way the sharks approach the divers suggests that they seem to know that. There was a recent story in the news of a manta ray, a shark's cousin, doing the same thing. These animals are, appear to be fully aware of what's going on. 
they, some of them may recognize that humans can do something that they can't do for each other, get that hook out. Let's face it, they don't want to have that hook in their body. All right, how am I for time? Do I have a few minutes left? Okay. That's cool. I won't need all that. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, though. Um, so I just want to finish up talking a little bit about our troubled relationship with fishes. Why do we treat them so badly? Why do we think that they're not intelligent and that they don't feel pain um, when the science clearly shows they do? Why have we developed these myths? Um, I think one couple of reasons is that fishes are more alien to us than other vertebrates. They've evolved in a different milieu. They live below the surface. We can look out over a lake or an ocean, and there may be thousands of fishes within inches of that surface, but we can't see them. And it's only in the last 50 years or so with the development of scuba gear and underwater photography that we can go and see them in their realms doing what they do naturally. Also, the fact that they don't blink. They don't need to blink, right? They're in the water. We blink to put tears over our eyes. They, their eyes are constantly bathed in water. They don't need to blink. And the fact that we don't hear them. It turns out uh, fishes make a lot of sounds, but they don't propagate much into the air, just as if we go and stick our head under the water and shout as loud as we can, it's not very effective because it's in the wrong medium. Similarly for them, they actually make all kinds of grunts, squeaks, and whistles, and other sounds to each other. So I think all of these things have alienated us from fish, and we think of them as cold-blooded, unblinking, unthinking, unfeeling. Not true. And unfortunately, fishes and their habitats are under a lot of pressure and there's a lot of problems. As you probably know, a lot of this makes the news these days. Climate change with the ocean, ocean warming, uh, acidification levels are rising in the oceans and fresh water, and you hear about coral bleaching events where the integrity of corals is being lost. Plastic waste is a huge problem. It's been estimated that we lose or discard about 640,000 tons, yes, 640,000 tons of fishing gear every year in the oceans. And unfortunately, a lot of that gear continues to wreak, wreak havoc. Ocean plastic, an insidious kind of invisible problem, I mean, I mean microplastics in particular, where the manufacture of plastics and also the exfoliants produces quadrillions, maybe even quintillions of tiny little balls of plastic that look just like fish eggs. So a young predatory fish like this pike eats them thinking that they're food and then cannot digest them and their stomach ruptures and they die. So I wanted to ask you this question, just, just in your head, you don't need to put your hand, oh, if you want to volunteer a, a theory, but I'll give you my, my vote for the most dangerous weapon in the world. And here's a hint. Almost all of the animals humans kill are to be eaten. And here's my answer, which relates to that. It's what we choose to eat that has the biggest impact on animals and really by extension on the planet and planetary health. It's not known how many fish we kill to eat every year. It's because we measure them in, in weight. We measure them by hundreds of, uh, uh, t millions of tons, millions of tons, about 100 million tons a year, just astronomical numbers. There have been estimates to, num to count them and it ranges from a conservative end of several hundred billion to close to, to three trillion a year. If you line them up end to end, they'd reach the sun and back, and with a lot left to spare. Just astronomical numbers of individual fishes. And I want to return to that point. They are all individuals. They're not just grains of sand. They're unique individuals. And unfortunately, we've been plundering the oceans for a long time. And it's estimated we've lost half of all marine life in the last half century. And the methods of fishing are crude and cruel and indiscriminate. Nets don't choose what they catch. They catch whatever ends up in the net. And so the fishes may die of decompression as they're brought to the surface or crushing in the nets, exsanguination on the deck, or suffocation. Not very nice ways to go. And it's a terribly wasteful uh, industry as well because... This is, this is the term bycatch. You may have heard of the term bycatch. It refers to the unwanted catch that, that um, are just thrown back into the ocean, typically uh, dead or dying. It's a very wasteful. Estimated of 200 million pounds of bycatch are discarded every day. You may have heard of uh, aquaculture, essentially factory farming of fishes. 
Some people say it relieves pressure on wild fish populations, but most of the fishes that humans like to eat are predatory fishes, which eat other fish. And what we're feeding them is wild-caught fish, menhaden and sardines and the like. So it's not really relieving pressure. Also, the living conditions for fishes in factory farming are terrible. Uh, they die of stress. These two fishes are the same age from a salmon farm. Uh, this one has what's called a dropout syndrome, where they become severely depressed. They stop eating, and their stress levels go up, and they just die and float to the surface. So it's also a, a pretty cruel industry. We, of course, have a choice in what we eat. All of us have that power to make a decision in what we eat, what we put in our, lives, in our mouths. We don't have to harm fishes to get protein and to live good, healthy lives. As Kim Williams, the previous speaker, said, we live not only healthy lives, we lead healthier lives if we keep animal products out of our diets. Unfortunately, today, we have lots of options that are coming on the scene. These are new companies. Uh, this one does uh, veggie shrimp. These are plant. This is a plant-based company. I visited their headquarters in California a couple of years ago. But you also have ones that are developing clean meat using fish tissue. It's a bit controversial, but it is another way to produce protein, in this case, fish protein that never required a fishing net or a hook or a fish who had to die and suffer. Of course, you don't even have to wait for this. I don't know if these guys, Gardein has a booth here, but you can go to the local supermarket and you can get very tasty products. I haven't eaten a fish in 35 years, so maybe I'm not the best gauge for how fish-like they are. But when I eat something, I don't say, eh, how like a fish is it going to be? It doesn't need to be like a fish for me. But it does taste very fish-like from what I can remember. And more and more to the point, it's delicious. And probably not very healthy. <laughs> so that's my overview of fishes. Um, I think we need a whole new view of fishes. They they do things that we often miss. We don't realize they can do that. They think, they feel, they have emotions, they have personalities, they're individuals, they can feel stress, they can feel pleasure. And they deserve a much better lot than we've been giving them. And I hope you'll be part of making that happen. That's the kind of world I want to live in. Thanks very much.